Hey everyone, for this episode we read Games of Empire, Global Capitalism and Video Games, written by Nick Dyerford and Greg DePator. I hope you all enjoy it. So this is kind of an odd book. It tries to use globalism and sort of explain globalization through the video game industry. So you're going to see a lot of like talk of the bigger companies and how those sort of take over like the smaller ones. Their big example in here is EA, but there are others, other examples of this as well. And another thing they go through is sort of how uh, labor has shifted for the most part from like the 1950s up until now. They talk about how back in the 1950s, 1960s, you were creating uh, you were creating like actual products. Labor would actually create a tangible product. That still happens now, but you, what you also have is this emergence in like the 1980s where the service industry and the entertainment industry like really started to take off. You always had movies beforehand or music where the entertainer's labor produced something but you couldn't like touch it or anything. It was just like an emotion that was created. Video games are kind of the same way, but then it takes it a step further where you're not actually creating anything that anybody can touch. You're creating like digital code and that sort of thing. Now this book, uh, this book was published in 2009, so it doesn't run all the way up to the current era, and they don't really get into like digital download games that much. There's a little bit of talk in it. But I think if they released another version of this, they would probably say more about how, you know, you're creating that immaterial labor. You're creating something that only exists on, a, on like a hard drive or something like that. You can't really touch this game. There's no physical copy of it. It's just the data that's on your actual hard drive, on your computer, on your PS4, your Xbox One, or on your Nintendo Switch. So next, the book talks about uh, just like a history of the video game industry. They start out all the way back when sort of video games were not necessarily being produced by government funding, but sort of getting made as a way to sort of demonstrate what that government funding is doing. So giving somebody like a practical application. And they bring up uh, Tennis for Two, which is kind of a, I think it's done better in uh, bit by bit, but they do bring it up here where Tennis for Two was created at a government funded lab and it was sort of a way for when they would bring people in, they could show them like, hey, this is something that we're creating here. This isn't like a weapon system or anything like that, but you can kind of see like the tech that we're, that we're kind of playing around with or creating here. And you had, um, the Odyssey also came out of that, where government funding wasn't used to make that, but the guy that worked at a government laboratory sort of got the idea, hey, I can make a practical application with this, and it can be sort of like a consumer project, and, or product, sorry, not project. Oh well. <laughs> but you saw that sort of happening in the 1950s, 1960s, then in the 1970s you had more of the sort of arcade games being developed and you had Atari sort of getting created and also consumer um, computers were also being made. So something that didn't have to be fit inside of a warehouse, you could actually make it into a relatively small box by comparison and it could be a home computer. You had those being made and it's just sort of a nice way to go through it. And then they get into 1985, so they talk like the post-crash with Nintendo, and that's kind of a, a nice segue for it. It's, it gets a little fuzzy when it goes into history like this, because books like these aren't really meant to be history books. They're trying to sort of set the stage for somebody that probably doesn't know anything about video games, so they sort of rush the history and everything. They do make a really good point though where they say video games were kind of a way for like anime and Japanese culture to sort of get more prevalence or to be more accepted. The book then goes into sort of the industry in creating video games and really the workforce itself. Instead of focusing on some of the bigger companies, they talk about the problems in the actual industry. 
I, I didn't really focus too much on this because I think this story is better told in other books like Significant Zero or Blood, Sweat, and Pixels where they really take more time to focus on like the people that actually make these games. Here it's kind of rushed, but they do make some very good points where like there really hasn't been a unionization of programmers before. You don't really see that. And honestly, they do make some good points where programmers are treated better today than they were back in the early Atari days, so like the late 70s, early 80s, where programmers were really just treated like dirt, especially by Atari. And that's kind of part of the reason why Atari went under, because they just they saw their uh, programmers as basically being no better than the people that assembled the cartridges, which isn't necessarily true. You need the people to put together the cartridges, yes, but without the programmers, there's no game to go in there. And if it's a bad game, it's still going to get slapped into a cartridge and sent out, but if it's a good game and it goes in the cartridge, it's obviously going to do a lot better. The industry still has a lot of huge problems right now with labor and everything like that, but it's better than what it used to be. And that's not saying very much. It could still be way better because what these people have to go through to make these games for us is just absolutely ridiculous. It... Then they get into sort of a section that's like the history of multi uh, mass multiplayer online games, which was really, really cool. And they talked about a bunch of them that I had really never heard of before. Uh, they started out with um, talking about uh, sort of like the first waves, so like Ultima Online and EverQuest, and a f there are a few others in there that I can't remember off the top of my head at the moment, and stupidly I didn't write them all down. But then they get into World of Warcraft, and it sort of fizzles out after that. There have been more since that, and for some weird reason they didn't talk about a lot of the ones that were on the Dreamcast or on... Uh, PlayStation 2, so they didn't get into, like, Final Fantasy XI or anything like that. I thought that was kind of weird, but at the same time, they had limited space, and it seems like this is more of, like, a PC-centric book. They don't really do a whole lot with home consoles, and kind of from the chapter that I hated where they just constantly talked about Microsoft, you can see they cared an awful lot about PC, and you see a lot of that from, like, the previous chapters. They the two authors didn't really seem to know a whole lot about the home console market. I was going to pull out just like a big stack of all the pirated games that I have, like the, the actual pirated games, so like the Tengen, the um, Color Dreams bunch games, and Chimerica cartridges to just pile up in a big stack here and be like, yeah, the, the, software, that, the software and hardware that, that Nintendo did to uh, keep people from making games for them and keep piracy away. Yeah, that really did a whole lot. But uh, I decided against it because I don't want to have like a stack of games just sitting here for the rest of this. Anyway, they to get actually back on track, and I'm really sorry about that tangent, um, so they go through the massive multiplayer online games and they talk of, about a few things specifically. They bring up sort of how these environments turned into almost like their own like societies and their own cultures and everything like that where you would have uh, players actually protest against uh, the game itself for for example with Ultima Online you would have like more experienced players just absolutely murdering all of the new players that came in the game which was really awful. I, I played Ultima Online like back in the mid 90s and it just, sometimes it was just absolutely horrible. You met some really great people, but it was really horrible. Especially for me when I was like, I think I was 15 or 16 when I played that. And they also talk about World of Warcraft, where you had uh, similar things, where you had certain groups that would kind of get, uh, like, kicked off the servers and whatnot by the mods, not really understanding exactly what the people were going for, like when they created certain guilds and, and whatnot. It's kind of an interesting way to look at it. So these last two, two to three chapters, I just sort of lumped them together because I didn't really feel like breaking them up and they sort of had a similar theme with them, so I didn't really see a point to it. These are where the book really gets into like the different corporate structure of the video game industry 
and how all these different companies sort of work together and all that sort of thing. And it really brings it back home to like their uh, globalization and their capitalization talks that they want to have in this book. Which is odd that they waited to get like a super direct point at the very end instead of really like putting it in the front and everything like that and having it defended throughout. But that's That might have been the way I did it, but again, I'm not a successful author, so whatever. What, what the hell do I know? Anyway, they really talk a lot about this stuff, and what I really like is when they go through and they sort of lay it all out. And This is just my interpretation, what they're saying. And it's that there were three big sort of the companies at the top, the ones that kind of control like all the platforms, essentially. And then you have the PC market as well, which... I kind of left as a, as an aside because nobody really controls the PC market. But to get back to the way that I sort of interpreted this, you have Nintendo, Microsoft, and Sony, and they kind of like control the keys to the sort of kingdom essentially. Then you have like the next tier, so like the big publishers, so EA um, and Activision, and probably some others. These people also make their own games, but they primarily just buy up sort of the mid-level companies. These would be like um, Bioware or Rare or certain companies that are like that. Sort of those mid-tier companies that don't necessarily publish their own games, but they're always making their own. And these are the ones that, you know, everybody kind of knows. You get sort of a feeling and kind of get an attachment to them and then EA buys them and shuts them down because they're an awful company. And that's my EA rant for this video, <laughs> sorry. And then underneath that you have basically like the small and the indie game developers. These are the people that can kind of take more risks, don't really have to follow the major trends of just like putting out first person shooters every year and calling it a day. These guys can sort of experiment. They can make games like Stardew Valley that go crazy or they can make games that are like super art house, like, um, I can't remember the person's name, but there's like a blind simulator where the only thing that's you can see is like a black screen and you're like trying to escape from a maze from it. If anybody knows the name of the game, then just put it in the comments below. Okay, so here's what I don't like about this book. Uh, it goes into political tangents a lot, like not necessarily, um, not necessarily following like a political party, but like following an ideology or something like that, if that makes any sense to anybody. This will follow like, okay, so this is like a political economic theory here, and this is sort of this one here, and that's sort of the way it goes. It doesn't necessarily follow like a clear cut, this is left, this is right, this is center. It ignores that bullshit, and it just uh, talks about like an actual political economic theory. If you go back to like when that was actually a thing and not just a stupid talking point. And for me, that was just really dumb. <laughs> I don't know why they needed to have those in here. There were some sections of the book where I was just like, okay, shut up and just tell me what you want me to know and stop repeating yourself over and over again. Uh, that, that was really annoying. What they do well is they bring in sort of like outside sources which are not necessarily in the video game industry so let's be honest the video game industry doesn't necessarily have like its own commentators and people that are going to write like those super high-minded uh, books and super high-minded theories those are all contained within the game and you actually like, really have to like look and find those within the games so they have to bring in some of these like political theorists and sort of society type people and or sociologists and and that part just when it when it gets to those i was like oh god and it would happen in every chapter at some point they would bring them in and i would kind of tune out and have to just plow through it to get to the next part that i would find interesting and that's another thing that i had a problem with there were some very interesting things in here but i really had to search to find them and it got super annoying <laughs> Anyway, guys, those are really my thoughts on this. Um, if you have any questions or comments, please put them down below in the video. I really do appreciate all of the criticisms and 
you know, if you and anytime anybody like says something nice about the video, I do appreciate it a lot. Uh, the next book I am going to be doing is actually uh, Symbolism. Of, the Symbolism of Zelda, Textual Analysis of Majora's Mask, which sounds super weird. And I did start reading a little bit of it, and yeah, it's super weird. So I'm really looking forward to finishing it. Uh, the guy has, uh, the author's name is Jared Hansen, and he's written another book about symbolism in a different Zelda game, so I'm probably going to pick up that and read that one a little bit later. I don't know if it's going to be good, I don't know if it's going to be bad, but I'm really looking forward to finding out. Anyway guys, I will talk to you all later, and have a great day.